Welcome to Subject to Change. Lauren and I are really glad to meet with John Sheehan tonight to talk about his winery. I want to know more. And then I say, book this person. <laughs> She's like, okay, Jody, whatever you say. So, and I don't know much about you, John, either, other than then I was interested in learning more about craft brewing and, 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 and wineries and distilleries, especially in New York. And, and Teresa made an introduction. So I'm really impressed with your spontaneity and your willingness to, to be here with us today. We'd love it if you'd like, comment, or subscribe. There'll be a little icon of a microphone in the lower right. Click on that to learn more. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, the uh, uh, winery itself is uh, a uh, hobby, really. It's something that I started with a friend, and we wanted to uh, see if we could do it or not. And uh, cool. for selfish reasons, we liked ice cider, but uh, mm. it was very expensive coming from Canada. Um, and we also liked uh, to try new wines and tried to make an apple wine with the cider that we were making from the property. <clears throat> and both stunned us with how good they came out. So we uh, uh, took our first batch across the street to Indian Ladder when they were holding a festival and sold everything the first day. So uh, we decided we'd get a license and, and do this for real. We're talking about a pretty old Dutch barn. You're on a farm that was a working farm and is a working farm, and it's it's got quite a history. 1736, you said. Yeah. That's what I wrote down. Yeah. yeah. The uh, Dutch barn on the property was completed back here. Um, wow. So, you know, 40 years before the Declaration of Independence was signed, and uh, that's really, awesome. While the French and Indian War was still going on, so. Uh, <laughs> The property itself has been uh, in continuous use of a farm since that time. Mott Apple Company, a New York State company. It has switched back and forth between dairy and apple production and was nice. the site of the Mott Apple Company that became established in, uh, in this part of the uh, of uh, Albany County. And then uh, once it became so huge, moved out to Western New York where it still exists out there. I didn't know the Mott Apple Company was a New York company. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's Started interesting. In, essentially in Voorheesville, and the old mill, the cider mill, is still there next to the railroad tracks. The structure was protected from being in contact with the ground for most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, just the exterior portions where the siding and the sills were uh, started to rot a bit because over a century or two or three, <laughs> uh, some dirt blew up against the side and started to uh, erode away at some of the, the uh, lumber, but the building itself is really incredible. It's uh, hand squared logs that are, um, nice. that there was no lumber mill in place at the time. So you can see the hatchet marks and the, the adz marks where they had to use essentially hand tools to make wow. a 50 foot long beam uh, perfectly square and straight. We took the old siding off of the outside and used it to build a, a tasting room inside, uh, resided the building, and uh, have set up some historic displays to explain the significance of not just the farm, but how it related to Thatcher Park and uh, the original settlers in the area. Such a great reuse project. I love the, in, the fact that you used the siding inside the building First of all, there's the character of that wood, but but something we're facing now, and, and Lauren and I get into this in a lot of our work, is embodied carbon and having materials that should be reused that no one's bothering to reuse because it's easier, faster, and cheaper to buy new. But the new is not certainly not better in most cases. It's just That's more right. it's more uniform. Let's put it that way. Exactly. <laughs> right. yeah. Uh, you, you know, one of the nice things about this is, is uh, the, the structure itself has some of the marks of the people who have lived and worked in it over the years mm. as well. So the Friar boys uh, in their teenage years got their hands on some printer's ink and wrote their names all over the place. <laughs> put, put, the date, <laughs> put the year on it too. So you see uh, uh, Peter Fryer writing his name in there in 1866 <gasps> and then his brother Albert uh, in 1868. Our intro to iced cider wine. What is iced cider? I've never even heard of this. 
What is it? It's an apple wine, and uh, it is um, made by the old apple jacking method of uh, using winter to concentrate the flavor. Okay. And uh, essentially, we let the cider freeze solid, and then we bring it inside and thaw it for, oh, uh, 24 to 48 hours and let it uh, get to about a third thawed and uh, pour the concentrate off into a fermentation vessel and throw away about two thirds of the volume in ice so that we've taken uh, uh, and sweetened the, it, it produces a sweeter, much uh, uh, more flavorful and, and more aromatic uh, uh, wine base that we then ferment uh, into a dessert wine. So it uh, has a, uh, without having to boil it, which would ruin the aroma, um, we can concentrate the flavor this way and the sugar to make it wine strength, um, but uh, really very intensely flavored wine strength. So you get a big mouthful of apple flavor right at the start and some sweetness to it. And then the sweetness kind of evaporates because we use a sort of a tart mixture of, uh, of apples to make, uh, to make this one. So it, I uh, love, I love that you're letting nature do the work for you. I think that's really cool. I'm wondering, does it get to the level of a, of a liqueur or is it never that potent? Not that potent. It, it gets okay. to about 14% um, alcohol, but that is twice as strong as hard cider. So yeah. uh, people who are used to drinking hard cider uh, have to be a little careful with this one because it catches <laughs> up to you a little faster. Gold medal winners. It's, it's got a big following in Montreal where uh, it really originated. And uh, it's great. only been around about 20 years as a style. So uh, we're pleased to say that uh, we have won two gold medals at the New York International Wine Competition in Manhattan for our ice cider. And twice now have been, the last two competitions we entered have been declared ice cider producer of the year. So um, that's we've, great. We've got some success with that one. And, yeah. Uh, uh, that, so, that's our so, top seller too. Terroir. We really wanted to try and reflect the immediate terroir of the of the capital district if we could we know that word uh, we do and uh <laughs> being able to uh uh relay that in more than one style was important to us as well because there's been a long history of wine making here but it wasn't all grape wines in fact mm. settle settlements in this area were so early there were no grape vines around uh they've not been brought from europe yet and the apple tree had not been imported from europe yet um, so uh, the first wine that uh, is in our historically uh, accurate repertoire is actually our 1736 uh, birch wine. And this is made entirely from white birch sap and a couple of other ingredients. And uh, that wine style was established in Europe, um, mostly in Scandinavian countries where fruit was scarce, um, but uh, Norway, and the Netherlands and Iceland, it's still being made commercial. It was never made commercially in the United States, even though it was wildly popular from about 1650 until, oh, probably about 1800 when uh, Thomas Jefferson started to import vinifera grapes from France. So wow. uh, it, it uh, never got real commercially popular uh, in the US certainly. Uh, and the reason we know that is that the federal government refused to give us a label for it initially. Martha Washington made a birch wine. If you take a look at her uh, book of sweet meats in the Philadelphia Historical Society, again, something we stumbled upon quite by mistake. Um, she, she had this recipe this in which she declared it to be excellent for procuring an appetite and for uh, curing kidney stones. Oh, which that's good to uh, know. Yeah, that, that perked up my ears too. I was surprised to find that there was some frontier medicine involved here. Doing the uh, birch wine, we produce almost all year long. Actually, okay. the birch season, uh, we're making wine in uh, March and April, and uh, with uh, apple season, we're uh, wrapping up right about now. And grape season, uh, we'll be making more uh, this time of year, right through the holidays. 
So, uh, and ice cider we tend to like to do as the weather gets colder. Um, yeah. uh, with climate change, it's not reliable that we'll get the kind of below zero weather that we need to get the uh, cider frozen solid. So occasionally we'll have to uh, make use of a walk-in freezer someplace, but uh, hopefully we can limit that. And, uh, There's a lot of history in this winery. What is a tasting room experience with you like? Because Great. I get the sense that it's like a walk down history. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you, a tasting at our place usually takes about a half hour. You get a good sense of what the building and the and the immediate uh, geographic surroundings are all about, and then we talk a little about the history of wine in the area and why we're making what we're making. And uh, the experience has has been uh, really very mutually rewarding because we occasionally get folks who are very familiar with local history who help us to add to the story oh, uh, some cool. tidbit that we've never heard before um and other folks who are uh really interested in learning about it and want to share something about other parts of the capital district that uh, may be related to wine so i've had a blast talking to folks about this the wine really represents place well i think that that's what's really cool about all the different uh, craft wines, beers, um, distilled drinks, is that they're, they're in, in so many ways reintroducing history to the process and lo the locality to the process. And so it, I was actually kind of distressed. I did some, uh, some really quick Googling before I got on the call. And the most, the most popular beer in New York State is Corona. My goodness. <laughs> and that has to change. I'm really sorry. And the most popular beer in the United States is Bud Light. You miss out on, on the spirit of a place when you don't try the food and drink from that place. Absolutely. You're just shipping it, you know, willy nilly. So I'm drinking an Omegang. Um, Excellent. It's called uh, Idle Days, but it's spelled I D Y L L as in idyllic. Nice. So idle days. So. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got my That's worth it for, for my Saranac legacy. Huh? Yeah, that that works too. Now, actually, it, so we're now I want ice cider though. <laughs> I know, I know, really. It's a frugal and creative process. There's something so I don't have the right word, but the attention to detail that went into the preservation, the honoring of history, not yeah. just of the place, but of the product. I don't think we do enough of that. No. I don't it was think- It's really important to us. And, and the sustainability of this was important to us too. Uh, what I didn't mention yet is that my partner and I were colleagues for 15 years at the Adirondack Council. Now, I'm still the organization spokesman and he was our uh, acting executive director for a while and chief lobbyist. But he's about 13 years older than me, he's retired now. And uh, so uh, we did this as uh, something that we could manage on our own uh, without having to uh, uh, make a lot of waste or have a huge impact on the environment at the same time. So. I'm happy to say that the entire operation is powered totally by solar and geothermal energy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that uh, we produce absolutely no wastewater uh, that has to be dealt with by any municipality or put in any waterway. How do you and, uh, figure that? Almost, uh, really because uh, the only water we really need is wash water. Um, mm. So uh, initially the farm, uh, the farm basement did not have a sink in it, and uh, I was having to carry things up out of the basement to rinse them in the yard, and that got us into the habit of uh, putting the uh, fermentation waste onto the compost pile, and uh, so there's really nothing left after that for us to throw away. Uh, oh my god, break, that's awesome. <laughs> unless we break a bottle or have to get rid of a box, uh, we can do either one of those through recycling, um, so we really... There's no trash can at this uh, at this place for anything other than things people bring in in their pockets and don't want to take home with. 
Okay, so I like the way you phrased that you got in the habit of putting the fermentation waste on your compost pile, mm -hmm. because that brings up something that I think is really important. We often do wasteful things because of a perceived convenience mm -hmm. to doing those wasteful things. And you never got in the habit of doing the wasteful thing of dumping the fermentation waste and having to haul it away. Get on the craft trail. I don't see us becoming a national brand at any point. And I'm, I'm not really interested in that kind of expansion just for expansion's sake. I think that this fits well into what is developing as uh, uh, a, a, an Upper Hudson Wine Trail mm -hmm. and the Capital Craft Beverage uh, Trail, uh, which are two vehicles for marketing this region for beverages that uh, are working pretty well right now. And we don't see one another as competition, but as oh, that's great. enhancing the overall opportunity for people to have fun with this with this new aspect of of, uh, of entertainment in the capital district so. i think that's great there's so much to see too in new york and and usually a trail gives people an opportunity to look beyond what they see from the highway which is another great experience i do want to say that uh i i also read that new hampshire has the highest alcohol intake per capita in the united states so there's some growth room in New York and, right. um, <laughs> and, and Vermont, Vermont drinks the most beer per capita in the United States, uh, I which I thought that. was interesting. Well, I mean, they get a leg up though. They've got fiddlehead. So, <laughs> you know, well, here you go. <laughs> so, so the craft um, beverage association and that trail that does that encompass that encompasses wine, beer, and distilled spirits, or it does, uh, as well as mead and uh, uh, kombucha, and uh, <laughs> even some non-alcoholic fermented things uh, besides kombucha. I'm going to call this the happiness passport. So wow. uh, we have 52 producers and a lovely little passport that we produce every year. And uh, we do it the old school way where you get a, a booklet and you have to go and visit and you get a stamp at each one that you go to. As you fill up the pages with stamps in the back, you get prizes from the trail. So it's a, a lot of fun for people. If nothing else, it's a great directory to the best of the, of the beverages available in the capital area. Right. Is and, this... uh, yes. I have a passport question. Is this yeah. like, <laughs> is this, is this something you purchase or is this free? It's free. We wanted to keep it free so that there'd be no impediment to using it. I'm not going to lie. I would I would buy multiples of these for gifts <laughs> if well, they were. You know what? You. That's a cool idea. Oh, yeah. Too. How about how about Lauren? You 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 get the passports and as a gift, you buy a certificate to the first place that you think that they should go. Well, and then, then you're golden. <gasps> so you've started them on the trail. How do I get passports? <laughs> you can get them uh, at any of the 50 producing locations or through the Capital Craft Beverage Trail itself. Will uh, they mail them? There's a website and you can get them mailed. Let's get back to that birch wine. So I'm still fascinated by the birch wine. And, and when I was a kid, I, our neighbors did elderberry wine and dandelion wine. And my, my, mm -hmm. My father-in-law did dandelion wine in the Netherlands, which was another thing. But I uh, was too young to appreciate those things then. <laughs> so, so now I, I now I have to definitely come check out the birch wine. So the sap process is similar to maple trees and sap. Um, it is. People uh, often ask if it's the same as birch beer, but uh, actually birch beer is made by boiling the root, like root mm. beer is. Um, and in this case, we draw the sap off and uh, people are also con concerned that it might be minty, but uh, it is not. Um, <clears throat> yellow birch, if you chew the stem uh, of one of the branches, you will find that it has kind of a, a, a wintergreen flavor to it. Mm. Um, however, um, that does not translate to the sap that's com coming out of the white birch or in our experience so far, the yellow birch either. Um, so uh, we mainly made this with white birch sap, mm -hmm. but uh, um, it produces a very light kind of floral wine, uh, dry, 
uh, with a hint of juniper at the end. Hmm. Okay, so, I'm all over that. That sounds like my like, perfect wine. <laughs> a, uh, a light, light gin almost uh, at the finish. Wow. So, it's uh, it's really quite delightful. A lot of people come and, and and buy it by the case because they've fallen in love with it. Okay, now I'm worried. How much do you produce, and when do I need to get over there by? You better go this weekend. <laughs> we produce about twenty cases a year, and uh, uh, we have plenty on hand. Wow, that's so cool. Say your partner's name again. Bernard Molesky. Molesky. Okay. All right, that's great to know. John really finds a lot of fun in this work. So this turned from a hobby into a business that's mostly a weekend business. Right. One of the things that I I've always been afraid of, if I turned any of my hobbies into a business, I would start to not like my hobby. Mm. Right. Are you seeing any of that happen with you? No, I think that uh, uh, this was a hobby. Making wine is a hobby that's not really uh, well suited to um, individual endeavor only. <laughs> that's a good point uh, it's great for sharing um now i get the chance to talk to thousands of people over the course of the year so cool. about the wine and what they like about it what they don't like about it uh whether they're uh, they've tried anything like it before if there are other things they'd like us to give it a, give a try to um and it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I'm learning something all the time. Um, I think it, it would become less fun if I were only running the business. Cork or no cork? One of the things that I saw happening pretty dramatically for a while, but now it's backed off a little, is a transition from cork corks to rubber corks. Yeah. Right. And screw tops. And screw tops, which mm -hmm. always made me feel like I was buying some cheap thing for five bucks at the right. corner store. <laughs> I just don't know what to do with that. What is the, what is, what do you see? Well, uh, two things led to that. One, corks started to get expensive because they were getting rarer. And there were so mm -hmm. many people producing wines and cork beverages that uh, the amount of natural cork available was starting to decline. Um, the second thing is there is a, uh, an interaction between uh, chlorinated cleaners and cork that creates a uh, bacterial growth in the winery that is bad for winemaking. Uh -oh. um, so if you are in a place, for example, where you are, cannot avoid using chlorinated water uh, to clean with, natural corks are not gonna be your friend. So if you're in an urban winery, for example, mm -hmm. that's using treated water in a city, that, uh, that even just as your production facility, that can have an impact on what you decide to use as a closure. Huh. Uh, we tend to use natural corks in the reds to allow some air transfer over time uh, because the reds will continue to age in the bottle and get better over time. The whites, we really don't want to change very much at all from the day that we take them out of the fermentation mm -hmm. vessel and bottle them. So uh, we would like to have a much tighter seal, one that does not allow oxygen transfer. So uh, the synthetics are very uh, attractive for that purpose. They're mm -hmm. also a little easier to get out of the bottle. Um, mm -hmm. I, I am stunned by how many people break corkscrews trying to take a cork out of a bottle. Uh, the, 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 the simplest twist in, pull out that I've, I mean, seriously has never failed me. There's a right. little bit of lever in it, but the whole ratcheting thing or the pressure ones where you insert air into the bottle and pop out none of those things make sense oh. to me <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> no i agree uh, and uh, it, so it when we uh we made decisions about that stuff we didn't want to use screw tops because uh i agree that that I don't want to be snobby about it, but it does automatically give me the sense that I'm not getting a high quality wine when I do that. And I, I, I know that's not necessarily the case. I've had some very good wines that came yeah, out. Me too. I will buy wines with cork or whatever, a more traditional stop, but I love me a twist off. <laughs> it's like, that's your emergency bottle. <laughs> what about boxed wines, Lauren? <laughs> no, I've not gotten into box wines yet, but people tell me that they've come a long way. Yeah, they've come a long way and they're a camper's friend. You know, you don't want to bring glass with you when you're camping or hiking or, you yeah. know. And more on grape wines. 
What kind of grape wines do you make? We are making uh, cold hardy hybrids uh, that are grown, that were designed for New York State, essentially. Okay. Um, the, uh, we have a, a the white grape wine that we produce is called Traminette. And uh, it is a cousin of the German Gewurztraminer. Um, and it was uh, essentially uh, grafted onto an American rootstock mm -hmm. at Cornell University to create this mm -hmm. Traminette grape that survives at 20 below zero and doesn't get the European diseases that, uh, uh, the, you know, the uh, fungal diseases that European grapes get in our human weather. Mm -hmm. um, the other, uh, the reds that we make are also cold hardy grapes. One developed at Cornell and one that's a more, uh, a, an older Canadian grape. Uh, the Cornell grape is called Coro Noir and that's a, a French Saval grape on an American rootstock. And it produces a very dark uh, colored wine, but uh, fruit forward and uh, light tannins like a Pinot Noir. So uh, mm -hmm. that's, we, we have that under our Blackbird label, uh, the Coral Noir, and a Deshaunic, which is a, a little, a uh, little drier, a little spicier, and uh, um, with a little more tannin to it. And uh, that's uh, our Blue Jay. And then uh, we combine the two uh, for a blend called Curious Cardinal. And uh, that, that's our top selling red. And, and it may only be because it's got a beautiful red bird on it, but that's, uh, <laughs> I don't want to argue with the successful marketing campaign. No, no, don't, don't argue that. My, my mother's favorite bird was a cardinal. And, and if I had known of that wine when she was around, I would have bought it for her. <laughs> you are not for, the first person I've heard say that. For some reason, when I think of craft, I think of limited, but you've just, through your description, illustrated how unlimited you are in what you can explore and do. Yeah, we really... We're looking more to produce uh, different palate sensations than necessarily a specific type of wine. John shares some of his craft heroes. Well, uh, I think the people that uh, we learned the most from initially in the Capital Craft Beverage uh, uh, effort were uh, Johnny Curtin over at, uh, at Albany Distilling. Um, Mike at, uh, at Altamont Winery, uh, who has been uh, very friendly and helpful from the beginning. And uh, uh, we've been very pleased to work with the, the folks at uh, Mackin and Casey, who are uh, the PR company that's actually doing most of the day-to-day -day promotion of Craft Beverage Trail. Teresa uh, Casey has done a terrific job. And, uh, Fantastic. Her work has uh, really helped the, the trail gain recognition and, and remain consistent and, and mm. uh, professional, uh, especially since it's all volunteer help. A craft grower knows what's important. Uh, I think globally, it would be uh, the need to curb climate change and deal with our uh, dependence on, on fossil fuel. The first 20 years of my life professionally at the Adirondack Council working on acid rain, and Ooh, we've yeah. come a long way. I mean, uh, we have improved the uh, uh, chemistry of the rainfall substantially to the point where it is beyond an order of magnitude less acidic than it was when I first started, um, which has made great, great uh, difference in terms of what's surviving in the Adirondacks mm -hmm. right but it's all for naught if climate change wipes it all out anyway. Uh, it, mm. it is, we, we may have saved 20 or 30 unique strains of brook trout from extinction, but maybe only for 30 years um, yeah. if, if it becomes too hot for them to survive. So um, this is all, it's all connected. We've got to, got to remember that. Do you find that the success in addressing acid rain gives you hope when you're thinking about climate change? It does, because we were getting the same kind of resistance initially that, uh, yeah. that I saw to climate change. Uh, we were able to essentially eliminate burning of coal to make electricity in the state of New York. And mm -hmm. uh, that, it's been illegal for two years now, and for I think six years now in Canada. Uh, it's quite possible. And 
uh, very attractive uh, and makes a big difference in terms of public health as well as environmental health. And uh, I gotta say, uh, mining and processing coal is probably the worst damn job in the world. And yeah. I think anybody that uh, wants to cling to that as employment is, is uh, only hurting themselves over time. So <clears throat> it, I'm not happy that uh, that an industry has to go away to make uh, make this happen. I, but if uh, an industry ever deserved to go away, this one does. But I think that's I think that's fair. And I, I want to say that 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 your focus on craft uh, wines and and a, a small business that's tied to a community is actually one of the solutions that is gonna help us with climate change. And so there, I have a lot of admiration for that. You have put your investment of your, your interest into a place that is, is actually feeding the solutions for that. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and I'll be drinking that wine at some point soon. So double thank you. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks in advance. <laughs> And here's our wrap up. Thanks, John. Oh All my right. gosh, John, this was exceptional. Thank John, you so wonderful. much. What a what treat. Pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, you for doing it. Uh, I'd yeah. be happy to do it again anytime. And I look forward to seeing what the, what the finished product looks like. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us at Subject to Change. All right. All right. Thank you so Take much. Care. Have a great night. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.